join me and this morning we'll be reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 46 to 52. One, two, three. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents saw him. They were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence here in this auditorium this morning. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us, minister, Lord, to our hearts. God, I pray that your voice would speak far louder, Lord, than any points I've prepared or any stories and testimonies I may share. Lord, would you minister to us and bless your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you grab your seats, please high-five each other and say, so good to see you. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome once again to our Sunday morning celebration. And uh, those of you at DUMC at Puchong as well, welcome. Uh, so good to, well, I can't see you, but you can see me. So let's pretend that I can see you. I'm waving to the cameraman instead. Uh, so good that you, you are here with us this morning. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Terry, and I'm one of the pastors here in DUMC. Uh, I look after the Next Gen Teens cell group. Uh, not cell group, Next Gen Teens Ministry. Sorry, I haven't had my coffee this morning, that's why. Uh, and it's a real privilege to serve uh, not just the young people, but God's people here uh, in this body. So uh, it's a real privilege of mine to be able just to share the Word of God this morning. Fun fact, it is the third year in a row that I'm kicking off our Advent series. I have no idea why. It's always me who's kicking off the Advent series. For those of you, some of you are nodding your head. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Three years ago, he was still him. Um, but it is a privilege of mine. And for the next, uh, you know, as we enter the season of Advent, the theme this year, as Pastor Janan has reminded us and played the little icebreaker at the beginning, is from heaven to earth. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came from heaven to earth as a human to bring hope, salvation, and love to humanity. Now, for the next few weeks leading up to Christmas, we will be exploring particularly the humanity of Christ. This week, as I kick off the series, I will be looking into the aspect of growing in wisdom and how all of us need to desire, not just to desire, but to lean in on God's wisdom for our lives. Excuse me. Luke tells the story of Jesus in a portion of scripture that we just read. Luke tells the story of Jesus, Jesus' growing up years. Now, just before the portion that we read just now, uh, Mary and Joseph brings Jesus to Jerusalem during the festival of the Passover. We will learn that this is an annual affair. Every single year during the festival of the Passover, Mary and Joseph would bring not just Jesus, but their entire family, all right, to Jerusalem to celebrate that festival. Now, as they return home, as in Mary and Joseph and the entire family, Jesus decided to stay back. But they only realized that he wasn't there after a day. How many of you here are puzzled by that? Parents, if you're here and you're like, huh? Wow, how okay, can Mary and Joseph only realize that Jesus, the son that was supernaturally given to them, was missing after a day? Now, I wondered that. As I read this, I was like, oh my goodness, I wonder what happened. Well, let me explain this. Back in the day, and back in the day meaning back in biblical times, uh, 
they would probably travel in large groups, probably for safety, also for convenience, because, you know, the entire town or the entire uh, village would travel together to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. So they would normally travel in large caravans, uh, probably other family members would travel along with them. Uh, it would be a, a big affair. <coughs> so remember that. Now, the child Jesus in that large group actually is not that hard to miss one of your children. Would you agree? If you don't believe me, I have three children. Louisa, Owen, and Lindsay. All right? About last year, early last year, a friend of mine from church, his name is Jared, all right? Our kids are the same age. We have three kids as well. The both of us thought, let's be father of the year, okay? Let's tell our wives, hey, darling, why don't you rest, okay? You relax. The fathers will bring the children to Aquaria KLCC. How many of you have been to Aquaria KLCC? Some hands, they're like, okay. So if you've been there, very nice, right? right? Now we chose Aquaria KLCC because it was safe. It's only one way. You follow, you follow the track. So in my mind and in Jared's mind as well, sure won't miss our children. Man. They will love it. And it was right at the time when my son, Owen, was really into sea animals. He was so into sea animals that in his sleep, he would be saying, oh, look at the humpback whale. So, okay, we made a trip out of it, okay? So, wow, we made it a very big deal, you know. We told our wives, hey, hey, relax. Sit down. Have yourself a cup of tea. We got this. So, very confidently, we drove to Aquaria KLCC, and we even had a strategy, okay? Jared and I, Jared was like, okay, bro, I will go in front, you go behind. So, we won't miss anyone. Foolproof or not? Good plan, right? <coughs> I see some of you parents with young kids, you're like nodding, you're shaking your head, you're like, you know what's coming. We started the tour, or we started the, 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 the trip, and my son, who was super duper excited, okay, he couldn't sleep. He was waiting for this moment all his life, which was just three years. The moment he, the moment he saw the first fish, he bolted, he ran. And I was like, oh man, oh man, you know, cause can't shout, right, in public. So I was like, oh man, don't stay with Papa, you know. And he ran, he bolted off, but I could still see him. So that's fine. Now, as I was looking at him going, suddenly, you know, everything was fine because he was following the track, correct? In an instant, in a flash, he reversed and he ran back. And I was like, zip. I could still see him and then I couldn't see him anymore. I panicked, so I, I signaled to Jared, Owen's missing, and he's like, come on, it's only one way, you know, how can he go missing, right? So all of us, we dragged all our kids, okay, you know, uh, turned back, and honestly, I could not find him. First thought that came to my mind was, how in the world am I going to tell my wife? All these thoughts were going on in my head, did he decide to swim with the fishes or, you know, what's going on? Okay, all these thoughts were going on in my head. So I, I panicked a little, honestly. I panicked and as I was walking, I saw him talking to a guard. Now the guard had the sense to see, hey, there's this small boy running around and he stopped him. He's like, boy, you know, where are you going? And then he started to tell the guard about all the sea animals that he knew. He was like, I want to go see the humpback whale. And the guard's like, see mana, the humpback whale. But he had the sense to keep him there, okay? So he kept talking to my, my son. And when I saw my son, can I just say that the first, I, I was flooded with emotions, all right? I wanted to... No words necessary. But ultimately, I was really, really relieved that I found him. So, it is not that hard to lose a child, especially in biblical times. Now, remember as well, probably Jesus was with one of his siblings, right? And that's why he got lost. Not saying if you're with your siblings, you will get lost, but, you know, his siblings were kids as well. After three days, so they were searching for him 
for three days. I searched for Owen for five minutes and I was anxious. They were searching for him for three days. <coughs> they finally found Jesus sitting in the temple courts. Now in the passages that we just read, the young boy Jesus astounded and amazed the teachers of the temple with the level of understanding for his age and stature. I'll get back to his age and stature later. Now the chapter ends by stating that Jesus continues to grow up in wisdom and stature, both in favour of God and men. How many of us in our prayers or in our daily thoughts desire for God's wisdom for our own lives? I'm speaking for myself here, my hands are highest. Now, most of us, i.e. me, will probably find ourselves asking for strength in our prayers. When we go through a, different, a difficult circumstance, the first thing that comes to mind when we ask God is for strength. We ask God for His power or we ask God for His forgiveness. But how many of us, as a first thing that we ask for, would ask for His wisdom? Let me tell you something about my wife. I've asked her permission to share this. And she said, okay, although she's not here, but yesterday she was here and she nodded in approval, so I'm safe. Her name is Rose, okay? Now, after we got married, in the early stages of our marriage, I thought, hey, let's ask her a question now. You know, because, okay, I... I've, I've, I was very close friends with my wife for 15 years before we got together. So in my mind, I was like, I know everything about her. She also knows everything about me. So it's very hard to make conversations sometimes or to get to know her better because actually we know each other very well. But I realized I didn't ask her one question, which was, I said, Rose, growing up, which is your favorite character in the Bible? And she was like, oh, wow. My favorite character was King Solomon. First thought that came in my head, oh, so lame one. Ah. King Solomon, why? Is it because he had many wives? <laughs> Evidently not, lah, okay? All right? And I say, why? And she's like, because he was wise and he asked God for wisdom. So then she will go on to share with me that she heard about King Solomon in Sunday school during one of the lessons. And that prompted her to ask her mom, Mom, do you know anything about King Solomon? And the mom was like, okay, just read the book of Proverbs. Lah. So ever since she was a young kid, she would read the book of Pro like Proverbs. That was her favourite book in the Bible. All right? And ever since then, when she was a young girl, she would pray, God, I ask that you bring wisdom into my life. God, that you will fill me with wisdom. God, bring wisdom into my life. God finally answered her because he brought me into her life. She also approves of that joke, by the way. And it's a joke. King Solomon asked for wisdom. The Lord offered to give him anything. The Lord said to King Solomon, ask of me of anything and I will give it to you. And he asked for wisdom to discern what is right and wrong. <clears throat> Friends, my goal today is this. It's as I share, it's to display before you the wisdom of God so that you would see it more clearly. And as you see it more clearly, you will learn to admire Him more intensely. And as you admire Him more intensely, you will learn to trust Him more firmly. And therefore, you will obey Him more consistently and joyfully. That is my goal today in sharing about God's wisdom to all of us. My big idea is this. God is infinitely wise. God is infinitely wise. Let's let that statement sink in for a bit. What does this statement mean to you? What does it say to you as you say these words? God, you are infinitely wise. Now, let me start with the definition. Wisdom in the Bible is knowing the greatest goal 
in any situation and the best way to achieve that goal. Let me just say that again. Wisdom is knowing the greatest goal in any situation and the best way to achieve that goal. That's wisdom. Wisdom sees the big picture. It's in focus, each part in its proper relationship to the rest. Wisdom is normally associated with people who are older. That is why teachers were so amazed at the understanding of Jesus when he was at the temple because he was but a young boy, he was 12. How could he know so much? You see, but wisdom is different from knowledge. A lot of us think that, oh, in order to be wise, I just need to know more. Lah. That's it. I just need to read more, attend more classes, memorize more. Therefore, I will be wise and I need to dye my hair grey and white. Grow a beard. I'm halfway there, although I'm losing hair. Wisdom is different from knowledge. You see, you can have knowledge without wisdom. Do you agree with me? You can have all the knowledge in the world, but you can, you can turn out to be not be wise. Friends, I'm sure you know, and I'm sure you identify with this, there are many brilliant fools out there in the world. I see some of you smiling and going like, mm-hmm, but I'm not talking about you, don't worry. There are many brilliant fools out there who regurgitate knowledge, but it's not in relation in achieving any goal. It just makes things worse sometimes. You can have knowledge without wisdom, but you cannot have wisdom without knowledge. That's why, friends, I'm not saying it's not important to learn, to grow, to educate yourself. No, it is. It is essential for growth in our lives that we would educate ourselves, we would grow, we would absorb knowledge. Because you cannot have wisdom without knowledge. The reason being is you, in order to discern the best way to achieve a goal, you have to be able to integrate, to fuse together all kinds of factors from various sources of knowledge and experience. So it's not just about what you know, it's knowing when and how to use the knowledge that you have. That is wisdom. Now let's take this definition of wisdom and think about God. What is God's wisdom like? Now the psalmist says in Psalm 147 verse 5, he says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. I love the NKJV translation. It says his understanding is infinite. Listen to the prophet Jeremiah. Pray to the great and mighty God whose name is the Lord of hosts, the one great in counsel and mighty indeed, whose eyes are on all the ways of the sons of men in order to give to each person according to his ways and the result of his deeds. When Daniel described God's wisdom, he wrote, he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. What do these definitions and what do these verses say about God and his wisdom? Well, nothing is ever a mystery to God. He is never puzzled or confused or uncertain. His wisdom is infinite. Paul tries to talk about the wisdom of God and when he does, it moves him to praise naturally. It says in the book of Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to 36, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable. His judgments and untraceable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counsellor? Or who has ever first given to Him and has to be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. What the Apostle Paul is saying is this, is that God's wisdom, in summary, is very deep. 
It is so deep that His judgments are unsearchable. God's wisdom is so deep that His ways are untraceable. I certainly can't follow what He's doing without being hopelessly over my head. It is so deep that no one has been or could be His counsellor ever. In fact, the wisdom of God is so deep and so expansive that He does not and cannot increase in wisdom. The only way He could increase in wisdom is for something to come into God's mind that has not already come out of God's mind. But remember in verse 36, it says uh, that he, this cannot be done because for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. So God's actions are always perfectly wise. It cannot get more perfect than that. That is His wisdom. There are no upgrades to His wisdom that are needed or even available. Would anyone on earth, you and I, in this auditorium or in DMC at Puchong or in your workplace, you think about the smartest, most wise person you know in this earth. Nobody on earth will be able to understand how his wisdom works. No way. He is totally out of our league and understanding. So with all of those things that I just said about God's wisdom, how do we trust him more because of that knowledge? The wisdom of God tells us that God will bring about the best possible results by the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible time. Can we all read this together? Now, as we read these words, can I ask you to weigh the words as they pass through your mouth? What does it mean to you? Are you ready? One, two, three. The wisdom of God tells us that God will bring about the best possible results by the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible time. What this implication from God's wisdom means is that whatever your life is right now, God is wisely and sovereignly ordering your circumstances to do something in you, through you. Whether it's in your marriage, in your family, in your workplace, in your witness, and in your worship that could, be, that could not be accomplished any other way. So if you are in a circumstance right now that you have no idea how to get out of, if you are in a circumstance right now and you find yourself praying, God, why am I in this circumstance? It is God's wisdom it is part of His plan that you are in this place and you are in this circumstance. Yes, perhaps the circumstance that you find yourself in is not is the result of someone's unwise decision. It could be that. But even so, God can use that situation and He wants you in that, in that situation, in that circumstance, so that He can work in through you. If there is a better way to accomplish these purposes, then you would be experiencing those other circumstances instead of what you are right now. I'm sensing that this is a reminder for some of us here. You need to hear this. That if there was a kinder, if there was a faster, more expedient way, God would be using it. So the circumstances you are in right now are exactly what you need for this period in your life. Let me ask all of us this question. Would it change things for you if you firmly believe that the problem in your life that is pressing, that's difficult, the one that you absolutely do not understand, the one that makes you feel so overwhelmed that you can't sleep at night and you're ready to give up, was actually orchestrated and allowed by an all-wise, loving Father to bring about the best possible, longest-lasting result for His glory and your good? Would it change things on how you approach that circumstance? 
Would it change things on how you react to that circumstance? This is not an easy statement. I fully understand. And I'm certainly not discounting how difficult it is, the situation that you may find yourself in. Again, like I say, it could be, in you are thinking in your head, how could God allow that to happen? But if you understand that God's wisdom is infinite, meaning that His plans and purposes and His way of getting you out of it is infinitely wise, if knowing that and knowing that you're in this situation and that God will deliver you in the best possible way, how would that change your mindset? Would it make a difference if you understood that your life is not God's plan B or C or D or E? That is always and only plan A. Designed specifically for you while you live in this fallen world. Filled with fallen people. Filled with fallen circumstances. What if everything in your life was a part of His wise plan? What would happen to your anxiety level? How would that affect your confidence in God? Friends, our God is infinitely wise. You are where you are right now because there is a reason and purpose to which the Lord requires you to go through in order to see His purpose reveal itself in your situation. And remember, His purposes and plans are always good. Let's let that sink in for a bit. God is infinitely wise. Now, I know sometimes it can be hard to, you know, kind of process that, especially if you're in a moment. Now, whenever I, 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 I think about this, I think about Jonah. I think about how, you know the story of Jonah? You know how God, when he spoke to him, God was like, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. I need you to speak to the people in Nineveh. I need you to call, I need, it's, it's a call to repentance of the people in Nineveh. Jonah was like, uh-uh, God, don't you know what they do? You want me to go there? They're the most evil people. Are you sure you want me to go there, God? I mean, I know about them. I've heard about them. There's no way, God, they will repent. Trust me. This Nineveh or Ninevites, they call them Ninevites, uh, Pastor Mike. Yeah, yeah, Ninevites. Hopeless one. No cure. This circumstance is a done deal. Okay, God, I'm telling you, okay, God. So instead of obeying God and going to Nineveh, he went like the totally opposite direction to Tarshish. Because in his mind, he's like, God, the knowledge that I have about Nineveh is that no hope, gone, no point. I will be slaughtered, God. Trust me, God. All right? You might have made a mistake there. Boom, he goes towards Tarshish. Okay, and then we all know what happens. All right, the God sends a storm. And then, you know, he's like, you know what? It's because of me. So, you know, they got him to throw him over the, the boat. And then the big fish swallows him up. I know this story well because every night I read this to my son and my third daughter. Every night they ask me to read this. All right, and the experience of the, in the belly of the fish, it was a totally unpleasant one. And then when he was vomited out into that beach, finally he relented and he obeyed and he went to Nineveh and the rest is history. You see, friends, that Jonah just depicts and illustrates to us what actually all of us go through in our daily lives, our, the decisions that we make. Sometimes God is saying, go and pray for that colleague of yours. Huh? God, you don't know this colleague lah. Hopeless one. Don't know how to do work one. And this colleague smells. 
this colleague only is only there because she knows the president. <laughs> Whatever lah. God, you don't want. No, hopeless. Trust me, God, you made a mistake on this. The only thing is, the Lord doesn't send a big fish to swallow us up, swallow us up and we are not in the belly for three days lah. How many of you have found yourself in that position? Don't put up your hands. Don't worry. You know yourself. That we think the knowledge that we have and the wisdom that we have is greater than God's. I'm the first one to put up my hand to say, yeah, that has happened to me many times. My God, are you sure? Speak to this person. Are you sure? Pray for this person. Are you sure? Disciple this person. Now, how do we get to a place where we are, where we are able to lean in to God's wisdom and to learn to fully trust Him? Now, it takes time and repeated lessons in humility. I'm very sure being in the belly of a fish for three days taught Jonah about humility. But it takes time and repeated lessons in humility to bring us to that place where we are able to rest in His wisdom and to trust Him. Now, today, this morning, I would like to suggest a few steps that we can take that can help us get there. And where is there? There's learning to rest in His wisdom and trust in His plans. My first suggestion is this. Wise living starts with fearing the Lord. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Fearing the Lord is basically this. You recognize that He is the Creator, your Master, and the Lord of all. He's holy and awesome, and He calls the shots. And He responds to that, you willingly submit yourself to Him and His plan for your life. Without this, there is no wisdom. It starts with salvation and it continues in reverent humility. So my first suggestion is that wise living starts with fearing the Lord. My second suggestion is this. Wise living grows by receiving God's word. Psalm chapter 19 verse 7 says, The instruction of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul, the testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperience wise. Nothing can match the Bible for showing you the mind of God. The more you sink your roots in God through His Word, the more wisdom will mark your life. Now, you may think to yourself, I uh, tell you this suggestion, I hear every week. My CG leader is always saying, have you read your Bible? My pastor is always asking, have you read your Bible? Friends, there's a big difference between reading the Word of God and receiving the Word of God. Would you agree with that? Many of us read the Word of God probably because of, I mean, we read the Word of God religiously. Can I be honest? Pastor Chris asks us, pastors and staff, this question all the time. Sometimes on Tuesday morning, staff devotion. When was the last time you read the Bible for yourself? And not because you needed to prepare a sermon or you forgot you need to speak at CG that night. Be real, huh? It's happened to me before. Tuesday, I get a message from a teacher. Hey, Pastor Terry, I'll see you tomorrow morning yeah, at chapel at 7 a.m. It's like 10 p.m. Oh, Lord, I forgot about it. Quickly, do up a sermon. Am I reading the Word of God or am I receiving the Word of God? I'm merely reading it to regurgitate it out later. So there's a huge difference when we read and we receive the Word of God, when we sink our roots deep in who God is through His Word. Wise living starts with fearing the Lord. Wise living grows by receiving God's Word. Thirdly, wise living requires that we ask for it specifically. James chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, 
driven and tossed by the wind. In other words, you don't come to God for a second opinion. We come to God to say, Lord, override your wisdom on this, God. Whatever you show me, I will follow. Wise living starts with fearing the Lord. Wise living grows by receiving His word. And wise living requires that we ask for it specifically. You know, the first two suggestions may be the easiest to follow. I always find that in our day-to-day lives, as we go through mountain highs and valley lows, the third suggestion seems to be the hardest for us fallen humans to follow. To say, God, in every situation, I go to you. In every situation, I seek you first. You know, the biggest danger is this. I'm not just speaking to those in difficult circumstances. I'm not just speaking to those people who find yourselves in a terrible situation in your life. Because sometimes, because of desperation, it's easy to come to God and say, God, show me your wisdom. Show me your way out of this. I'm speaking more to the people who think they have it. I'm speaking to the people who think they have the greatest plan. It's year end, right? Budgeting happens. I I think by now should be done already, budgeting. Budgeting and planning. Probably there's some of you here, you're like, I'm a brilliant budgeteer. Budgeter. (laughs) I'm a brilliant planner. I'm so gifted in this, I don't need to, I don't need to ask anyone about, about this. I know what I'm doing. Can I remind you? Have you sought the wisdom of the Lord in what you plan, in what you're about to do, in all that you're going to do? So it's not just the difficult circumstances that bring us to asking the Lord specifically for His wisdom. I would even encourage you, if you think you got it, can I encourage you, brother or sister? Seek God's wisdom specifically in all that you do. As I come to a conclusion this morning, I would like to share a quote from A.W. Tozer and he's a famous author and theologian and in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, he wrote these words about God's wisdom in our lives. It's a little bit long but please, please allow me to read this. To believe actively that our Heavenly Father constantly spreads around us providential circumstances that work for our present good and our everlasting well-being brings to the soul a veritable benediction. Most of us go through life praying a little, planning a little, jockeying for positions, hoping but never being quite certain of anything and always secretly afraid that we will miss the way. This is a tragic waste of truth and never gives rest to the heart. This is my favourite part. There is a better way. It is to reject our own wisdom and take instead the infinite wisdom of God. God has charged Himself with full responsibility for our eternal happiness and stands ready to take over the management of our lives the moment we turn in faith to Him. Friends, God is infinitely wise. In the midst of whatever circumstance you find yourself at, at the tail end of 2023, or if you're anxious about the year ahead, I would like you to see that flowing from that truth that God is infinitely wise, It's a perspective shaping and a comfort giving, an anxiety killing and a prayer inducing implication that will revolutionize your life if you would only take it as your own. If you would allow the words, God is infinitely wise to infiltrate every portion of your life, my prayer is that it will shape your perspective moving forward. 
is that He'll give you comfort in mourning, in grieving, in pain. Is that He will eliminate your anxiety in whatever situation you find yourself in. And it would induce you to prayer, genuine prayer. And ultimately, it will revolutionize your life. Going back to the young boy Jesus that we just read. You know, there's one thing that he grew up in the last portion of that scripture. It says that he grew up in wisdom and stature. And I believe he grew up in wisdom and stature because he was close to the Father. When he was at the temple at age 12, he realized that he needed to be in his father's house. He knows and he knew that he needed to be close to him. So friends, as I invite you to stand to your feet and we'll go into a time of worship. As we sing this song, first and foremost, can I ask that you would get close to God. To say, God, first and foremost, I, I lay aside whatever I'm going through. I lay aside whatever's on my, in my head. God, I will come close to you. Lord, would you come and fill me? I dedicate my life to you. So come, let us all stand to our feet. And let us sing this song. Hallelujah. Every song we could ever sing. Yes, Lord. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Yes, you are Jesus, the only Every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. point I would like to invite the pastors and leaders just to come up to the front and I would like to open this floor for any of you who need prayer and specifically if there's any of you here right now that you need to lay down your plans you need to lay down your circumstance and you're saying God I need your wisdom Lord I need your wisdom on this if there's any of you, even as we sing again, I want to invite you. Would you take that step of faith and allow us to pray with you that you will be filled with God's wisdom in whatever circumstance or whatever situation in your life that you find yourself in. Perhaps the Lord is leading you as I mentioned, as He's calling you to, to pray for someone, to disciple someone, to speak to someone to love someone and you're struggling with that or the Lord is calling you to go to a certain place or a certain position and you're struggling with that can I invite you to come out would you allow us to pray with you not to discern with our knowledge not to discern with our wisdom but to pray for God's wisdom to fill your mind and to fill your heart that He may direct your steps so that you will find that you can lean on His wisdom and that you can trust His plans. 
So friends, if there are any of you right now, as we sing this again, I'll invite you, come up to the front. Please allow us to pray with you. Hallelujah. Oh, sing hallelujah. Jesus. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Oh, we trust in you, God. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Come on now. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Sing holy, holy. Sing holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Oh, Spirit of God. Just avail yourself. I think there are people who need prayer. pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning, those that are out here for prayer and those that are in the congregation. Lord, I ask that, Lord, that you would bring peace, you bring comfort, Lord, to their hearts. Remind them, God, that you are infinitely wise. Remind my brothers and sisters here that in whatever circumstance they find themselves in, it is in accordance to your plan. Remind them, God, that regardless of how well they think their plans are or how good their situation is, Lord, that they will, should not turn their eyes away from You. So, Lord, remind them, God, that they, of their dependence on You. And, Lord, that would You bless them. And, Lord, would You bring them, Lord, a peace that surpasses all our human understanding in whatever situation or circumstance that they find themselves in. Lord, we glorify You Lord, we, we believe, Lord, that you will be glorified 
in whatever situation, Lord, the outcome, God, you will be glorified. You will be lifted high. There is your name above all names and that's Jesus Christ. And Lord, we declare that name over every situation. We declare that name over every disease. We declare that name over our families. We declare that name over our businesses. Lord, we declare the name above all names because you are worthy, Jesus. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And all of God's people say, Amen. God bless you. We are still open for prayer. Please do come up if you need prayer. But if not, God bless you. We'll see you next week.